Um, I have a little bit changed the, the outline of the classes for some things like I had yesterday and also for in the, the, the presentation you gave for the poster. That's quite, quite useful for me because now I know, know what, what you are interested in. And so I, uh, what I will discuss today is in fact what was referred to as vector 3, is the small noise problem. Okay? Which is also for the, so it's, it's the small noise. Setup, which is also referred to as a Fredlin Wenzel theory in, in, in math and uh, in physics, the action that's there, they're going to be an action. It's sometimes referred to as, as on side of your even though it's not exactly the same. Okay. So, what, what, what we, this will be about is stochastic differential equation. Stochastic differential equations. So just write these are equations that are of this type. They start like an ODE, so it's x dot. It's e, so it's a function of time, right? It's dot of t. It's equal to a b of xt. That's the, called the drift term. But then there is something that is added here, which is. Uh, so I'll write it at this, I will need a little epsilon because this can be a small noise. I'll explain that in a minute. And then there is a, a sigma typically and then an act out of t. And so that's the drift, this first term here, the drift term, is deterministic. And that's a noise term that is being added <coughs> in the equation to model stochastic effects, okay? And this noise term has the following property, which is that it's a, it's a Gaussian noise, so it's Gaussian, with mean zero, and with covariance, which is just given by this, so the E of eta of t, eta of t prime, that is just a, a Dirac. So it's a white noise. This is referred to as a white noise. Okay. Um, okay, so, so mathematicians typically write this equation differently than that. So I'll just write it down. And they will be, I'll post on the Dropbox notes, in fact, a book on, on these things. Um, which I will ask you to not distribute because uh, it's, uh, it's being published now, so I'm not completely sure whether the copyright. Okay, so mathematicians typically write that slightly differently. They write it like this. dx equals b of x dt plus square root of epsilon sigma dwt. There is a reason where, where, where this guy here the WT is, is called the Wiener process or the Brownian motion. Okay. The reason why they write it like that is simply because, and perhaps you already, some of you already know that, but it's simply because uh, this is slightly misleading to write an equation like this because, in fact, you can, the solution of this equation are continuous in time, but they are not differentiable. They're continuous almost everywhere, but dif differentiable nowhere. And so that's why they write it like that. Which in fact is reminiscent of what you would do if you were to try to simulate these equations. Uh, because if you were to simulate with a, with a time step delta t, there are many ways you could do it. But one way would just be to do that. You would do this. And then you would add. Uh, delta t times the bx of t, this, if you were just to do that, would be for Euler, <coughs> for the ODE, which is not a very good scheme, but, but it's one that's consistent. But then you need to take into account what's happening with this. And so, well, that would be taking square root of epsilon. I'll discuss the sigma in a minute, by the way. So that's the, so you'd put that, and then you'd put delta w. Now what is delta W is, is essentially if you integrate that guy. And it turns out that this quantity here is a Gaussian 
that if you want this scheme to be consistent with this SDE or written like that, you, you need to put some statistics on that guy, so it's a noise, that, who, that needs to be consistent with what you want here if you take delta t going to zero. Okay? <coughs> and in short, that means that this needs to be a Gaussian process which means zero and variance delta t. Which means that, so this guy here, right, needs to be Gaussian also, right? And then it, not, it has to be such that the expectation of W is equal to zero and the expectation of W squared is equal to delta t. Okay? And by the property of the Gaussian, that means the following <coughs> thing that I'm just going to go up to down here, okay? Is the <laughs> you're gonna, you can write that. It's equality, what people, they write sometimes like that. It's equality in law or in distribution. That you can write that as being a square root of delta t times an n01, where this guy is just a Gaussian with mean zero but variance one. Okay. Now, if you look at the equation written in this way, you see that there is a problem because uh, we don't do it like that. Because if I were to want to go over here, I need to subtract x of t, divide by delta t, take the limit, right? If, if sigma was or epsilon was equal to zero, this guy would not be there, it would be no problem. But if this guy is there, well, there is a problem because I divide square root of delta t by delta t, so I get one over square root of delta t, that blows up. Okay? That's why mathematicians prefer this form rather than this one. Really? Yeah. Um, the expectation of w squared is the expectation of delta w squared that you wrote here? Delta, um, yes, sorry. Delta, that guy. Yes. The winner process is, uh, is th this is the expectation of W, this delta W is also equal to delta WT plus delta T minus delta T. And it's equal to that. Okay, that's what you obtain if you integrate that. Okay. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Uh, maybe later we'll discuss this in more detail. Uh, the things become a little bit tricky if this sigma here which in a minute I will just eliminate but if this sigma depends on x itself then there's an additional difficulty which is that you need to define which is related to the, the fact that this guy is not differentiable you need to define whether here you would evaluate that say, if it were to depend on x whether you would evaluate that x of t or x of t plus delta t, or anything in between. If this guy was not there again, and I would just look at this equation for the ODE, you know this is forward Euler. I could write backward Euler, if here, which would be an implicit scheme, if here I would put x of t plus delta t instead of x of t. And as far as the ODE is concerned, this change changes essentially nothing well, nothing in terms of the limit. It, it, can, it can make a big difference in terms of the stability of your numerical scheme or its accuracy, but it doesn't change that the limit is always well defined and it's the same thing. If you start playing with this for the sigma, again, the, assuming that it depends on x, then the limit that you get depends on what you do there, which is also related to what I'm discussing here. This is this famous Ito versus Stratonovich. Right, which, which, as far as mathematics is concerned, is a non-issue. You just define what you want, and that's it. It's, it's sometimes a debate because, uh, in terms of modeling, it makes a difference. You need to figure out which one you want. There. I'm not going to, you know, deal with that. In fact, for most of the talk, I'm going to simply take sigma equal the identity. Okay, and because uh, for what I'm going to be discussing, the rule of sigma can simply be. Uh, taking into account by changing the metric, and I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so that's, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this equation, and I'm going to give you just one more thing, right, which is that, that's what I, was, I wanted to discuss today, but I'll discuss maybe, uh, you know, later. This defines a stochastic process, which has also the property that it's Markov. Okay, that means that, well, which is kind of, what is a Markov process? It's a process where you can 
tell what's going to happen in this future just by knowing its present and not knowing the past. It's obvious that the Markov process simply by the line that they've written here, which means that in order to know whether it's x of t versus delta t, I just need to know what is x of t, but I don't need to know all of the past. Okay, that's right. So this Markov process, and that I'm going to write on the other side, but I think this is going to be time. I'll try to do it a bit longer, but... Uh, no, no. So, so there's two things that are associated with this, right, that we will need later. One is that there is an equation for the probability <laughs> density function of x. Okay, so let, let me write that. So there's an equation that you write like that. If dt of rho is equal to the divergence of bx rho plus, and if I don't take sigma equal 1, epsilon, in fact, I'm not going to take sigma exactly equal to 1. I'll take it to be a constant time. So like, like epsilon like that, and then there's the Laplacian. So this, this PDE here is the equation that governs what is rho is the probability, probability density function of x of t. So it, it essentially is a function, so rho it's a rho, the rho here is a rho that depends on time and x. And it, give the pro, it gives you the probability density to find x of t, the process that there, at position x and time t. Okay, and you solve it typically with an initial condition, which is uh, at t equal <coughs> 0 is a, is a Dirac delta of x minus x0, where x0 is the initial condition that you take for this equation. Okay, so that's one equation that you have. And then, they, so in, in, in this is called, so this is the Fokker Planck equation, sometimes called Schnorishovsky. It's also called by mathematician the Kolmogorov equation, Kolmogorov equation, and the forward Kolmogorov equation. And I'll explain maybe later why it's called forward, but, but there's one thing is that typically math mathematicians don't work with that one. It works with the adjoint of this equation because you can define the adjoint. Here you see, in order to define this equation, you need to have that B is differentiable. But there's another equation with which it's not completely clear why that should be the case. If you look at this guy, whose continuity is enough. So there's another equation that you can write. And that equation is that, like that. Uh, is that you can, so you can, so, and you can define, so this is for the PDF. But you can define another object which is that you can take the expectation starting at point x. So this here, x was the final point. That's where it's going forward. Here is the initial point. Is the, <coughs> so this means expectation starting at position x of a function f evaluated on x at time t. OK, so, so, so uh, is everybody happy with this notation? This, this is, again, the standard notation. This says. You take the expectation, meaning the average, over all x of t, all solution over there, and, and I write this little subscript, which is the way it's typically written in, in the math book, of the process at time t, but this is just the same as the x of t. This is the you know, same notation as that, right? This is, you know, right. Okay. Of some function, that's an observable, right? This defines a function u defines a function u of t and x. Here, this is the final form. This is the initial form. It's the expectation over x or over t? Expectation over, over x. x. Over x. Uh, no. Over is the is, is the conditional expectation starting at x. The expectation is over the realization of the noise in the equation. <coughs> okay. So expectation over the winner process. This guy satisfies another PDE, which is dt of u is equal to b, there was a minus here, right? Times this u plus epsilon over 2 Laplacian of u, with initial condition that u at time t equals 0 needs to be equal to f, which is clear from this because if I take t equals 0 and x is the initial condition at t equals 0 x of t is x so there is no expectation that you need to take and this is 
this u of t equals 0, x is just that. Okay? And so this I'll keep. B is vector. Hmm? B is a vector. B is a vector, yes. So, so, uh, right. So, for, yeah. So, so this guy typically takes value in RD, but <coughs> later on we can, you can think about fields. We're going to look at that later. And B is a vector field from RD to RD. Okay? Uh, sigma is typically a matrix that I have taken to be the identity. I'll put a constant in a minute. A and this guy is a vectorial. Right, so I should have put here probably an identity matrix. Right? And, and this here is like you know, that guy. Uh, this, you know, just to fix notation, so, so this is the gradient, this is the divergence, and this is the Laplace here, two derivatives with respect to space. So how do you do go from U to rho? Well, okay, good point. So if you solve the equation here, okay, no, I, I'm gonna, if you solve this equation with this initial condition, that time t equals zero, this guy is equal to delta of x minus x zero, right? Then, so then, then, then it becomes, we all become confusing because you can obviously write that the expectation of x of f of xt, by definition of what rho is, is the integral over whichever domain this get for the, could be rd of f against rho. I know I need to be a little bit careful about that. We need to change all of the notation because now this becomes an f of y, right? Let's, and then this guy is uh, t of y, right? And, and the, there is an, the initial condition x0 here, so let me put, needs to be taken as being that x. Right? I mean, is that clear or? You're working with SDE, so you should be the one in the room who knows about this, right? Uh, any <laughs> question about this? I mean, at some point, you know, the, the difficulty here is that there's too many x's and y's in that, that needs to be used. At some point, you need to kind of use, reuse them, right? So, so I use you know, the, the x and this line is not exactly the same as the one that's there. I could change all of these x's into y's to kind of make a better connection with what's going on over here, uh, but then it might become a little bit so okay. But let's, let's keep it. So this is the relation between the two, okay? And in fact, this guy here, this relation, is one specific instance, the simplest one, of what's called Feynman's Katz formula. Because it says that you can, it's, it's, it's a relation between the solution of a PDE, right, and an expectation over the solution of an SDE. Okay, I mean, if, if the noise was not there, right, then this equation, these equations would be used to leave an equation. They would be first order. Yes? And first order equation you can solve by method of characteristics. That, that's, and these are the characteristics. Okay. This is the stochastic equivalent of the characteristics for this equation which is not first order. And because it's not first order, when you solve it by the method of characteristics, the price you have to pay is that the characteristics are no longer ODEs, but they are SDEs. All of that, I, I'll give you notes about them. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, it, 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 you know, this, there's, there's a lot of material in this, but I, I will have to glance over that because I will discuss one thing which is probably try to make a connection. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So in order to write this uh, frequency, frequency with Starting at x, yeah. we have to have uh, the row at t equals zero to be uh, Dirac or not? Yes. Do you have to have this condition to write this, or can you have? Yes. Any? Otherwise, what you suppose that this guy was not a Dirac. Suppose it was a row zero, yeah. right? <laughs> then you know when I when I write this integral, I would take also an expectation with respect to the initial condition. 
So, so if rho of t zero was some initial distribution, rho zero, then on the left hand side here, I would have to take this guy, but then take its expectation with respect to x zero. Okay, whatever x zero is. Right? But here, is, you know, the picture is just that you fix where you start and you have all of these guys. Why? why? You know, many of them, many realizations, because each time you take your realization of the noise, you get something else. And then, right. So now, that, that's not what I want to discuss today. I mean, this is the problem. But what I want to discuss is the fact that when you send, ah, maybe, maybe two more equations, which is that uh, this equation takes, you know, a form that you know if B is minus the grade of a potential. So if b of x, right, this is the, if b is minus the grade of a potential, this is the standard focal point equation that you would write, right? And you know in particular that its stationary solution is the Gibbs distribution, Gibbs density. In that case, right, if you look at the stationary solution of the focal point equation and we'll look at that in a minute it would be e i'm going to write it with an equilibrium because it's like that. so sorry I'm, it's so there's another thing that I this would be when i take sigma to be uh, kbt 2 kbt times the identity and b to be equal to that then the stationary solution of the focal point equation would just be this expression, where z is the normalization factor, it's just the integral of that guy, and beta is 1 over kdt. I'll get to this in a minute. If you plug this guy, so you take the equation which is here, right? Um, okay, in fact, sorry, I'll do it slightly differently before because it's going to be. I made a mistake here, which is I want to have sigma to be the identity is if epsilon is equal to 2 k dt. If the epsilon I have is equal to 2, so if you replace epsilon by 2 k dt, you take b to be minus gradient of u, you can check that this is a stationary solution of the equation. In fact, it's a stationary solution with zero current. Meaning that what's equal to zero is this term, and only one, where you use one derivative, so you plug one of the derivative of that out. Oh, I'll get to that in a second. But, okay, these are all the parameters that I need for today. Okay, now, what I want to discuss and make uh, the connection with is that if you look at this equation and you take epsilon small, what does that mean? And that's why I just, it's just this. Epsilon is always something. You know, for example, in, in, the, in, in Francesco lecture, there's always a small or a big parameter that's hanging there, but it's maybe not specified explicitly. So I, I, I want to have it to be able to take limit. But what does that mean? It would be suppose you have a situation in which the temperature is the, of the system is much smaller than typical energy bias, for example. That would be a case where epsilon is small. Okay, and that, we're going to discuss that in a minute. Okay, so when epsilon is small, which is, you know, uh, when this guy goes like that, we, this is a small noise limit, right? This equation satisfies a large deviation principle. So I'll just write it. Remember, there was an action yesterday, so there's a large deviation principle, which was an act, and so when it was an action, so I'm going to write what the action is here. And I'll write it in terms, it depends on time, and I'll write it, okay, I'll write it in terms of a phi, to try to distinguish, let me explain what this is in, in a second. So this guy is simply this object. Phi dot so of t minus b of phi of t square dt. Phi has the same dimension of as x. I'm using phi here instead of x to try to not kind of have all the things mixed up into what is the stochastic process and what is the, the, the argument of the action. Yesterday, 
when I was doing you know, the, the, the derivation of the, the, uh, the, the large deviation, phi was denoted as A. It was an I of A, you know, it's an I of phi. And now, so, so the action that you have here, the large deviation action is that one. Okay? And so I will just write to you what that means. Okay? It means the following thing. Just I'll do one, one, one guy. It says that, for example, if I take, let's take this guy. So this is bad and lemma, if you wish. Explain for this specific action. I'll, I'll try to derive this equation or, or motivate it in a minute. It says this, suppose that I take the expectation starting at x of uh, the exponential. Of, so I'm going to take a specific observable, which is 1 over epsilon of an f of x at final time, t. That t is that t. You can define this action for any time, finite. And, and, but the time you have here is the one that you digress. So I'd like to, I'd like to calculate this expectation. Okay. And what, what violence lemma in this division tells you is that in logarithmic equivalence, this is nothing but the expectation of 1 over epsilon times the max over all phi, which are such that phi at 0 is equal to x, that's that x. Yes. Uh, of, so that's of f of phi at time t, that's this t, minus s of t phi. Uh, not s, i, sorry. Okay, so this is Vardan's lemma and the contraction principle. So let me try to motivate this in two minutes, okay? <coughs> This guy is a white noise and is a Gaussian, right? So if you were to kind of really forget about all kind of rigor, you could write down what is typically written down as the, the, the winner measure for this quantity. What's the winner measure? So I'll do this derivation, but then I'll erase it. Because if, <coughs> I, if my colleagues see that, but I could get that. fired. <laughs> yeah, all right. We can erase this. <laughs> So what you would write is something which is like this. This guy would be the path measure of the eta. You would write, I mean, sometimes something which is written like this, okay? And, and, and this guy would be the path measure of, of, the, of, of this quantity, right? you, okay? Now, if I, if I now do something which is like, uh, okay, so it's not actually, it, it's W, it's W dot. It would be just this in that case, because I, I, I did the white note. I'm used to putting a, the, the W. So, that, okay, so this would be just, this is the measure of that guy. Because if you think about it as a Gaussian process, right? It's a Gaussian process, so its measure is quadratic with, with a coefficient which is the covariance or the inverse of the covariance. But here the covariance is just the Dirac, right? So its inverse is also the Dirac, and so that's what you write. Right? This is like uh, e to the minus eta c minus one eta, but with this c minus one. Right? Now, if you take this at phase value, it's very difficult to give a meaning to that because of what okay, so You give this, and then you solve this equation algebraically. You say replace eta by x dot minus b divided by square root of epsilon. What you end up having, if you were just to do that, is you would replace this factor by this one. And now you have x dot minus b of x squared dt, okay? And now this measure would be like over all path in x. Sorry, but if we do things where increasing variables, so a term which is like the change of variable and like in the third variable, 
this way? In this case, you 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 wouldn't because because it's uh, adequate noise. But there's no, this is why we don't do it this way. <laughs> I'm trying to motivate, but but by trying to get, I mean, th 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 these objects have absolutely no mathematical meaning. So trying to put Jacobians is like you need to do it by Gesner. I'll do that in another class. Okay. okay? But let, let's just kind of try to follow this just as a, you know, as, as, as almost as notation, right? This is that guy. If you solve it, you get this one. And then you say, well, if you think about this as a path integral, it gives a weight on every path. If I give myself a path that go on, to, you know, start at time equals zero, go to all the way to time t, I give myself a path. That's its probability weight, if you wish. And then you say, well, if I know wanna, if I want to compute an expectation, okay, well, I should do a path integral. So I should represent that as being a path integral of this quantity over all path. You would put this factor here and then do this path integral. But since there is this one over epsilon everywhere, right? You say, well, in fact, this path integral will be dominated by the the the, the, the saddle point configuration. Right? This is the Laplace method. We discussed that yesterday. And what does that mean? Well, it would mean that you just maximize the integrand. That gives you exactly that. Okay. Now, the regret, what I just explained cannot be justified rigorously that way, but it gives you the right answer, which is that if you think about this as a path integral, if you think this, about this expectation as a path integral over this path measure, and epsilon goes to zero, you get that. So now I'll erase that. Like, so one, one lemma is that. And then there's another. OK, so you can do that. Right? You can, you can do uh, that thing. Um, you can also compute probabilities. If you want to compute what is the probability starting at x that x at time t be in a set A. So, so the little picture, make a little bubble here, would be you know, you start at x, and then there's this set a, and you're asking what's the chance that at time t, x of t is here. Now this guy there would be x at capital T. So you're asking something like that. Okay. Uh, well, this would be same thing, except that in the Mac. So sorry, I know I'm not gonna. I'm gonna write it like slightly differently, which is minus one over epsilon. And only is the min. In fact, I will rewrite that as a mean observation. When you take, this means all the, all the path, but now you take phi of zero is equal to x, phi at time t is in a. And here you just have the action. You just write that. Okay? If you want to make the, the connection between these two, put the main here, put the main there, change these signs. What I've written is exactly the same thing as before. But now you see that, in fact, this, this, ex this is like taking an expectation, but over the indicator function of the set A. And then you get that. OK? And so I I'll show you in a minute. I mean, this is useful. Because if you think about it this way, you, you can reduce something that can be quite complicated, which is to do Monte Carlo. Right? Suppose I want to compute this expectation. Suppose that x lives in a very high dimensional space, might be the solution of a PDE, kind of thing that Francisco and you know, other lecturers will be discussing. You can't solve this. Analytically, you can't. Numerically, you can't either, because you can't discretize these, you know, you cannot solve numerically PDE in very high dimension. Right? So you start. So one way you could do it is by using this Feynman Katz formula. Just generate many, many, you know, do Monte Carlo. Generate many solutions of this equation, and then average. But if this is a rare event, right? Typically, this will not work very well. You will, the statistical accuracy that you will have, the, the sample size that you need to generate, how many parts do you need to have something which is accurate will be very small. Uh, they will be very big, so the accuracy will be very small. This turn this problem into a minimization problem, which is easier to solve. And I'll, I'll show that to you in a minute. Okay, so that you have these two relations. Okay. 
And now, so this is for T finite. <coughs> and all of this is for T finite. But there's another quantity that you can define, which is called the quasi-potential. So let me try to introduce that one. And it's called the quasi-potential because you will see in a minute that it reduces to the potential when the system has a potential. And the quasi-potential is this object. It's a, v, it's a function of two points. And it, you define it in the following way. And here I need, I need int, because in general, this mi there's no minimizer for this. Let's find an else. So you take phi at 0 is equal to x. You take phi at time t is equal to y of the action, i of t of phi. But then you also take the nth over all possible times. In general, that means taking time t going to infinity. So in this, in this expression, you're asking what are all of the paths that would go from, say, x to a in a fixed amount of time. When you compute this object here, in some sense, you're making the path integral not only over all paths in the way they can do it, but also in the time they take to do it. And there is an equivalent statement for the, for that, which is so you can you know there is something that you can show with, with this expression, which is that why do you say that the interface usually taken at the to two independent of the distance between x and y, the, the optimal time. No, in general, it's, it's, it's go, it's, it depends what the but in general. What, it depends, but in general, for example, if x and o y are critical point of b, then it will be a time t equal infinity. Okay, that's what I'm going to discuss here. So in particular here, suppose that suppose that I denote by rho and e, this is the stationary <coughs> solution of this guy. So is if you take d t rho equals zero. You know, the d, t, and e equals 0. Okay, it's the one that solved that. It's the one that, that you, if, you know, it could be that your system, if you, if, you, if you evolve the system, after a while, it settles. Meaning, the trajectory keeps moving, but in terms of probability, the probability settles. This guy, this row, I put it n, e for non-equivalent, because in general, it will not be of this form, if the b that I have here is not of gradient form. Okay. But assume that it exists. Right? In general, you cannot write it explicitly. For systems that are not in detailed balance, you cannot, you, it's not, I mean, you cannot solve this equation, but you cannot solve the equation where you put 0 here either. There is no analytical solution that's available. OK? And so you might prove that this guy exists, but you might not know what it is. But this object here, the service, gives you information about that. Yeah. So let me consider two cases that I will focus on later on. Which is imagine first that the x dot, the ODE, as a single fixed as a single stable fixed point at position x1. So what you should imagine is that there is x1, and if I look at the flow line of, of this equation, they all go in. It doesn't necessarily need to be a gradient system. They don't go by steepest descent, but they all go towards that point, and it waits seconds. Okay? If that's the case, then what happens is that <coughs> If there was no noise in the equation, you know what rho, this rho non equivalent should be. It should be all the masses on x1. It should be a Dirac at x1. No matter where you start the system, eventually it will end up at x1, and that's the only thing it can do. It will lose its memory there. So this rho and e, in that case, would be just a Dirac at x1. Even if you start at the Dirac at x0, which is this x0, it will go there. Now, if there is noise, no matter how small the noise is, this statement is no longer true. It will be able to go away a little bit because that, that, that term will push it away. 
if you want to know what's going on if you go around here, right? well, that you can do by central limit theorem. But for example, you could ask, what is the probability? I would ask a question like this, which is, what's the probability that I find that the system makes an excursion into this set A, which doesn't contain x1, and is away, O1 away from x1? This probability will be exponentially small. You may want to know how much it is. Right? So you can calculate that using what's going on there, because you can, there is an estimate that says that the rule non equilibrium at any x goes like the exponential of minus 1 over epsilon of the v, this v, evaluated at x1 and x is the quasi-potential of x with respect to x1. This formula is sort of a generalization of this formula without the normalization factor, but I don't care because it's large deviation, so I don't know what is the prefactor, right? Where you replace the potential by the quasi-potential, okay? And I'll show you in a minute that, of course, it's consistent. If you take B to be greater than U, the quasi-potential better be the potential, <laughs> otherwise I would run into, right? But the beauty of the formalism is that you don't need it to be a gradient for writing this thing. This is true no matter what. Well, the assumption that I have, which is one single fixed point. Now there's another situation which is kind of you know relevant. Is suppose that x dot equal bx has two points we can generalize two state of fixed points. Of course, we can generalize that to n, but, but uh, let's okay. two stable fixed points. So it's a different situation at x1 and, say, x2. So here, the little picture should be something which is like this. There's x1, and then there's x2. Okay. And then locally here, the flow goes to that, the deterministic flow goes towards these guys. But something needs to happen in between. So there should be, I'm, I'm going to write that in 2D, but there should be that there's two, there need to be two regions. If there's only two, there are only two things. They, I need to be able to split the, my space into two, which is such that everything that starts here ends up there, and everything that starts there ends up here by the deterministic dynamics. Okay. In high dimension, it can do that in a complicated way, but it could be, for example, that there is an XS here, a saddle point, and that there is a separatrix which has a stable manifold where everything goes in the XS. That has co-dimension D minus 1 if, this, if X here is in RD. Right? It's a separatrix, it's an hyper surface. And then there is an unstable direction that goes like that. Right? Mm -hmm. And on this side, everybody goes there. Mm -hmm. And on this side, everybody goes there. OK? Now, there is a statement like this that you can try to find out before what is the, the equilibrium. Here, you need to decide, you need to calculate, given any point, you need to calculate this object. But the reference point that you put here may depend if you're on that side, it will be x2. If you're on this side, it will be x1. But there is something else that you can be interested in here. Which is, okay, again, if there was no noise, you start the system, and whether it is, you know, in, in this region A1, it ends up in X1. If it's in region A2, which is the other side, it ends up in X2. That's without noise. And that's what it would do. It would end up there. But if you put a little bit of noise, no matter how small, but positive, epsilon is positive, no matter how small, then eventually the noise might push the system from this guy to that guy, or the other way. And you may want to know what is the, the, the time it takes. You, you can define the mean first passage time, mean first passage time, to go from x1 to x2, or, or conversely from x2 to x1. OK? Th this is what, it's, if you want a, a definition, is the expectation starting at x1 of the inf of all time t such that 
x of t belongs to a ball of radius delta around x2. If you're not happy about this, just, it's just you put a little ball of size delta here, small. You start, and the size of this ball for the statement will make, make no difference because at the end of the day it has to go above this range and then it's, the thing is gone. And I want to estimate what this guy is. Right? The mean first passage time to go from x1 to x2. This guy goes like this. Plus 1 over epsilon of the v of x1, x2. This should be reminiscent of something. So this is just Gibbs, right? Boltzmann Gibbs. And that says there's an equivalent of Boltzmann Gibbs for non equilibrium system. This is a renewed flow. Because you know that if there was an energy barrier, the typical time it takes to go above an energy barrier is the height of the barrier. Right? Well, this says, of course, if there is no barrier because there is no potential, like, like if, again, if B is not a gradient, right, this guy could be a vector field. But there is no landscape. There is no barrier. But there is an equivalent of it, which is this. OK? OK. So I, I will. So this time is the time for the That's why I'm two, two million. Ah, it will depend on XS. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now let me let me do. Uh, we, we're gonna. So I, I, I'm gonna keep these guys here, and I will specialize that for this action in the case where. So I'm gonna quickly recover the case. You know, we, we'll do this little calculation. Okay. So let, I mean, because it's actually quite simple. So I need to calculate the quasi-potential. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll write it here, okay? We don't need, the, we don't need this anymore, we remember. So I'll write the quasi-potential here quickly. Is dead. Okay. So let's do this calculation. After that, I'll tell you what happened if you are in a <coughs> non uh, non gradient system. So this. So let's just let's just look at very 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 fast because I want to. I want to go into something which is uh, more, maybe more novel. <coughs> let's just do this minimization if B is a, let's do the minimization that are here or here, right? If, if B is a gradient, okay? If B is a gradient, this picture, the picture that I draw, they change because if B is a gradient, right? So for non, I'll do that. Right. In this case, I'm going to have I'm, I'm discussing this guy, gradient of u of x, and so here I'm back to the equilibrium case. Okay. So this this means what the situation where I have only one fixed point. I mean what that means that this guy is single well. Okay. And so there you know I can these are the, the level set of 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 u. This is u equal constant, right? And, and the, the line that I have there are just the one that are everywhere. So it's the steepest descent. So these lines are perpendicular to the, 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 the level set. Okay. So if you do that, there is a little, you can notice that there's one little calculation that you can do, which is that you can say, okay, let's look at phi minus. So phi minus b has become phi plus grad u of phi. Okay. And then, you know, I have that square. And so I can always write this like that. I, you know, I, I, okay. And then I can write that like this. And then, well, uh, for, for 
that sounds so full because there's a two there. So then you have you have a minus gradient gradient of that. So this guy cancels this one. And what remains here is phi dot. You see what you have here is just now phi dot grad u, which by chain rule is simply u dot. So it's d over dt of u of phi. Right? And now you see what happened is that if I integrate this guy from zero to t, by the way, in, in the case, uh, so I'm catch, sorry, there's one more thing, right, which is I need, I want to have a one fourth here. Because, okay, I, want, I mean, this is the two that's there that I need to take into account. And so that's the case where, in order to get, you will see I need that guy there, is the case where I'm actually, the case I'm discussing now is the one where I take the two epsilon. So that epsilon is the temperature. Okay, otherwise, it would be two times the temperature. Should I? Well, actually, let, let, let me do it like that. Let me do it like that, just with the one half, as I was before. Sorry, I know you detest when I do that, but I, I, okay. <laughs> I, 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 will, uh, I, will, I will make the connection later. It's because there will be a factor two, uh, but, but, but I'll get to it. So you know, I get this. And then, of course, this quantity here, right? is a total derivative, so what I have written here is that this quantity is simply equal to the integral from 0 to t of phi dot plus the gradient of u of phi squared is equal to what? Well, what comes from here, so that's u of phi, okay, so it's u of phi at time t minus u of phi at time 0, and then I have plus the integral from 0 to t of phi dot minus gradient of u of phi. Yes? And now what you realize is the following thing. So if I want to, suppose that I want to calculate this, my quasi potential. And that x1, right, I want to, so I want to make the inf of this guy, where x1 will be that point, and x is somewhere, anywhere else, right? There's an x here, okay? Then there is a trajectory that descends from there, right? There is a trajectory, this trajectory here is the one that solved that equation, yes? But this trajectory, there's another trajectory which is the one that goes in that direction. That's the one, okay, so, so maybe I should do that, right? If I put this guy in green, that's the one where I change that into a plus. That one would go up. Yes? Along that trajectory, I can make this term zero. Not that one, obviously. But this one, yes. Yes? Because if phi is, e uh, if phi is equal to plus gradient u, then I will do my value. I can get that, get rid of that one. Two to energy. Hmm? Sorry? Two to energy. No, 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 no. Uh, but you are right about, I don't know if that's what you said, but you're right that there is a two missing here. <laughs> which, is, which is the two, uh, which is actually is the four. There's a four missing here. There's a four missing here. Right, anyway, that's just a change of argument. So I can make that guy disappear. Yes? And then the only thing that will remain is <laughs> the difference. But I know what that is, because this one is x1. I I'm doing a constraint, right? Where I start, I'm calculating v of x1 to x. So this guy is x1, and this guy is x. They are given. They don't depend on the path, because it's just about the endpoints, right? And so I, I can, in principle, zero that guy and just get this, yes? But but that that's what, okay. So now now this is the place where I I, I need a, okay. So so what, what is the what what I have obtained? If I write what this is, uh, no this one, right? Let me just specialize this. It's the equilibrium one now. So let me specialize this to what I have obtained here. It would be exponential of minus one over. Uh, um, 2 epsilon that's because there is a 2 here right? and then you have 4 
u of x minus u of x1. So, so this is just 2 over epsilon, right? And if epsilon is 2 kBt, which is what I need, you see, this is nothing but this formula here, without the prefactor. But with the u is being, you know, I, I have changed the scale of u, I have just put a 0 at, at, the, at, the, at the, the, the x1, right? So this is indeed exactly rho e of x. Okay? For a graded system, the quasi-potential is the potential. Right? Now, you notice that I did something here which it, it, there is a step that I skipped, which is that the solution of this equation here, if the potential is smooth, mm -hmm. right? the solution of this potential takes the, the red one, takes infinite time to go into x1. Right? They, they can't, I mean, they... They, they, because uh, they, they, this exponential that they take, right? They think about x, x dot equal minus x, so it's e to the minus t. It takes infinite time, right? So that's why I need that guy. In order to really zero this, sorry, I need to allow myself enough time. But I have all the time I want because I can take the imp over all possible time. So you can take it. Right? If you take a finite time that's not going to be enough, this guy would be not exactly zero, but I can always make it a little bit more zero. Okay. So you get that. So you see that this result, I mean, so you, you, you might say, well, it's a, lot of, uh, so, it's a lot of technicalities to get into something with you, but uh, remember that, that these are most, the, the statement I made here are more general because they are also true in non equilibrium systems, which is a big deal. But I have recovered it. Now, this argument gives you that too in terms of the Arrhenius law. Let me explain why, why that's true. If you look at this situation. Uh, uh, could you just ask, before that, uh, explain why you get rid of the, the other integral? Like this one? The, the, yeah, the plus potential instead of the... Because, so, so the, the trajectory Right, the deterministic system trajectory goes down here. Mm -hmm. Right, but but I can have a virtual trajectory that goes up here. That's the one that solves this system with a plus instead of a minus. Right, if I use that guy, it kills this one. I just change time. Right? I don't change the time. I just go back. I mean, I, 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 yeah. If you wish, you go back. It's actually it's a good point. Changing the sign here is like changing the direction of time. And there's, there's a reason why that's the case, is because, so that's actually a good point, we discuss that quickly. Um, systems that are in equilibrium satisfy detailed balance. That means microscopic reversibility. That means that there's something which is remarkable about the, this equation, B is equal to a grad U, or minus grad U, which is that if there was no noise, everything would go downhill. And so clearly, if I were to give you a movie of what's going on in the system, you'd be able to tell, well, that's forward in time, and the one way it would go up here would be backward in time. As soon as you put the noise in, the statement that I just made is no longer true. In fact, if I were to give you a movie of this Brownian motion, right, you, but with the noise, you would not be able to tell me whether it goes backward or forward in time after, you know, if you look at the trajectory at the equilibrium. Okay? And that's that's a statement about the fact that the generator here is self-adjoined with respect to this distribution. We can discuss that later. But <coughs> this means, let's give an intuition for what's going on here. If you have this microscopic reversibility, it says that the way the system goes down from x to x1 is also the way it will eventually go back up. But viewed in reverse, right? Because otherwise, they would be able to tell us the direction of time. Okay. So if I know, if I tell you, start at x, what would the deterministic system do? Well, it goes down. But you say, well, then I when I put noise, if I want to go back to x, it will go definitely. That's what this is, argument is saying. And justify it. <coughs> and that's detail balance. <coughs> okay. Now, I have no idea what I'm doing about time. Okay. Thanks, sir.
So um, <clears throat> let's discuss this, the Arrhenius. So in this case, the picture change. So let me erase that picture and make the one for the, for the Arrhenius, which is, no, I have, I mean, I have two fixed points. Okay? I have two fixed points, uh, which is, so the picture that you would think about is more something like this. This is, you know, this is a landscape with two minima, right? One which is at x1 that's here, and the other one that is at x2 that's here, okay? And then there is this saddle point between xs, right? And the trajectory, they go like that. They go down like this, and you may make them maybe in red, right? So that you don't, you see something. So the trajectory would go like that. There is that, and then there is an unstable manifold that go like this. It's called the minimum energy path. I'll explain to you in a minute why. Right? Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the trajectory, they would just go down like that. Okay, you know this picture. I mean, it's just okay. They all go like this, right? And now, <clears throat> I know, I know. Suppose I want to do this. I want to do the minimization, which is here. I, I, I try to calculate the quasi potential to go from x1 to x2. Okay? So then I can, sp I mean, I can do, okay, so now they think about what's going on here. If I'm on this side of the barrier, right, if the process is already on that side, I can just zero this by going down here. Yes? But if the process is still on the side where it needs to go up, then I need to do something. What can I do? I can do exactly the same argument as here. So in other words, split the time into two, right? You take zero to t, and then t zero to t prime, right? You, you split this into an integral from zero to t prime, plus an integral from t prime to t. That one is the half of the process where you are gonna go down. Now this is where we need to go up. So how do I go up? Well, I do the same argument. Okay? And then, now there's a bit of something which is that if I do the same argument, and I could say, well, let's put, uh, sorry, this is the one that goes down. The, this is the one that goes down. So the one that I want to do is this guy, right? So, like that. So, if it goes up, well, x1 is x1 because that's where I start from. But I need to decide where I'm going to, where I want to go in the middle. Yes? That point needs to be somewhere on the separatrix. Because on, I need to cross the separatrix to be able to go downhill. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I reach the separatrix, I can make that guy again go to zero, because I go uphill there. And then, which point should I choose here to minimize things? Xs. Because Xs is the minimum of the potential on the separatrix. Right? Mm -hmm. since, the, since the saddle point it's S, right, is, is, is at the center of the stable manifold of the separatrix. That means it needs to be a minimizer of the energy day. It's a saddle, right? It goes desert. But, but here it's like, a, right? So you get. And so now you can do the same thing. But what you end up having is that the quantity that you have here becomes 2. And the 2 is because, again, it becomes 2 of u of xs minus u of x1. And you see that the x2 has disappeared, as it should be. The, the, the x2 there, the, the role of this x2 here, is just to say, bring me on the other side. It doesn't matter where. Because to go on the other side, you better go by xs. OK? OK. So that, that means that you can try to calculate these guys. Can you turn on the, 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 the projectors? That means that you can calculate this minimum energy path. And uh, one of the things that I do, or I did, is to find methods to calculate this uh, minimum energy path, in particular the string method. So I'm just going to, you know, a little interlude in the class, and then we're going to go back to the non equilibrium case. Right? And I'm going to show you what the string method is by, by just showing. So the idea is that, of course, you would like to not write down equation. Well, you, you, okay, I'll show you. I mean, it's going to be easier that I just show you what this on the, the screen. You can actually find this minimum energy path by moving curves. I'll just show that to you. And then I'm going to show you a curve which I hope will uh, 
But it's a trivial case, but maybe it can spark your interest anyway for something. <laughs> No, but it has to be HDMI. Yeah, HDMI. No, it's HDMI. This is not HDMI. It's computer one. No, it's everything else. Yeah. No, no, but it doesn't say signal. No, no, sorry. Unplug, replug. Unplug, replug. It's stop Show the, I'll explain to you that later. You can find this minimum energy path by a simple little code, which is here. So let me just show you what you know one example. So this is a curve, and by moving curve, I'm going to find. The, I'm going to make this guy will go freely. This guy will go freely, mm -hmm. and all the other will will be required to move on the potential. But that's a curve that I will be parameterized. So when you do that, and I'll explain to you maybe later why. Or to, you get this. Is it, do you see this or not, not at all? Mm -hmm. It moved and it gave the name on the, the name of energy, but the, the, the residual, okay, so that's that. <laughs> now, I mean, this is not, so, I mean, anyway, so this picture shows you a minimum energy path on a, on a potential with three wells. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, this is not very, uh, but of course, everybody's always pr plotting these things, you know, 2D, but, uh, but, 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 but in fact, you can actually do things that are a little bit more interesting with these type of techniques, if I find them. Right. So this is a system of soft sphering 2D. I mean, it's a baby example, you know, by, by, by the standard of anyone working in this field. But I'm going to do something which is a little bit... Uh, remember that in the, the 2D there was a curve that was like it's going straight. Now I'm going to create an initial condition here, which is that I take that guy and I take that guy. Right? And I'm going to create an initial curve that connect them. Of course, I, this is a very complicated landscape because it's not two-dimensional. And so the curve that I picked is this guy. It's a stupid curve. Okay. It just interpolate, and I have taken, I have tagged these two guys, and I, right? And then you can ask yourself, what's the minimum energy path? There are many because it's a very complicated yeah. system, but you can actually calculate. So you can run the code that is just there. I can pause this for you if you want. There's a string method, and then you can ask yourself, well. I'm going to do this uh, step by step because otherwise it runs a little bit too, too, right? So these are the two guys, same as what they were before. And then if you look at what is the minimum of one of them, this is what you see. <coughs> so, you know, this, the, the two guys, they will go where they're supposed to be because their endpoint is fixed in this case. But you see that they are doing that in a way where there is a lot of rearrangement everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I mean, 
can just give you the code. This running five minutes, two minutes in my on my laptop. It's really so guys, not only one single code. No, there are many. <laughs> Obviously. Right? So you can, you know, you can do it. You know, in fact, I mean, you can analyze this system a little bit. I, I plot these figures here. Maybe they are, <coughs> actually, let me just show them all to you like this. You see these guys here? This is, I mean, if you look at, you can minimize. So this is, you know, this, this configuration I started from here is a minimal energy configuration. I just let them all relax. So what you can calculate is you can calculate the, the, the value of the Hessian. Right, you look at the Hessian and you look at this eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. So what, what these figures show, I'll maybe zoom on one, like this guy. I mean, I'm not an expert in these things. I'm talking about things that are really, well, no, I know I cannot, if I change, that's my, my plan. I can't change the speculation. So this is the displacement field that you have along the, one of the eigenvectors, the one with this eigenvalue. It's one of the soft modes that you have in this system, as you wish, if you wish. And you can see it's fairly non-local, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. it kind of is not because because I'm, I'm you know I'm close. To, it's a soft, so I don't know if it's jamming transition, but it's very, fairly it's fairly packed. So that means that you know when, when you can't move one guy without moving all the other, right? And and so the other figures are just but this is these are local pictures because they just tell you how the well is done there, right? If you want to know, or you, or you go to, from here to here, where you exchange these two guys, mm -hmm. you need to go uphill way far from this, and do many of them, actually. Right? And that's what, again, uh, this, where is it? That's what this guy, you know, no, moving a little bit faster, is actually doing. You just, so, so it, goes, you know, it goes way past this uh, Anyway, that's just to kind of motivate. That was that. We can turn on the turn off the. That was just to motivate a little bit. Um, calculation of minimum energy path. He's just telling you one. Th the reason why I did that is simply for one reason: is that even though the equilibrium setup is actually quite simple conceptually, right? And you know, from the viewpoint of you know, if you talk to probabilists, this is something that they know and consider completely solved for many many years. But, but if you want to actually calculate these objects in practice, it requires a little bit more tool. So that's that. Okay. Now, let me briefly explain. How much time do I have? Uh, 15 minutes. 15? Oh, 13 minutes. 13. <laughs> Being precise. So let me go back to the general case. Because at the end, what I told you is that, OK, all of this, the string method relies on the result that you knew before. Right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't really look at this quantity. So let's look at what you can do in non-equilibrium system. So in non-equilibrium system, and, and maybe at some point I will have later on in the class to derive this for you so that you know it's right. So the same formula. Let's, let's just look a little bit what are the structure of the equation that you have. Because they are sort of useful. So. Let's look at this, and let's say I need to minimize this object. Right? All of the problems that I'm doing, forget about that for a minute. Let's just look at what's going on here, for example. I need to perform minimization of this which are constrained in one way or another. And so I can think about that as the integral. So I, I, let me show you two things you can do with this. One is that you can think about this as the integral of a Lagrangian. Now, so I could write down the Euler Lagrange equation associated with this Lagrangian, and I'll do that in a minute. But in certain cases, it's better to go into Hamiltonian formally. So let me discuss that. Which is that there was this L, I can introduce an H of phi, theta. I'm going to use theta for the conjugate momentum. Just, just, to, uh, just, because, just because. So I can calculate this. The Lejean, it's so, I mean, you know, if you need one tool in, in the class, it's the Lejean de Transform. So I take the Lejean de Transform of the, the Lagrangian. So I trust that you can do this. It's a quadratic thing, so it's very simple to do. What you end up having is that you can, you know, you can convince yourself that this is simply the inner product of B and that. 
Plus, <coughs> I forgot to mention something. If this sigma was not the identity, then all of these inner product or this norm would be defined intrinsically in the norm that's induced by sigma. We can show that. So, so in fact, this formula are general even though there is no sigma. And it's even true if sigma depends on this. You can look at this. This is the Hamiltonian. So if I want to minimize this, Right? Is I can notice that this is a convex functional. It's not like the it's not like the Lagrangian that you have in classical mechanics. This one is much nicer. Okay. So if I want to do minimization of this, I can just write down what are the Hamilton's equation. So what are the Hamilton's equation? Well, it is just phi dot is equal to d theta h, and theta dot is equal to minus d uh, phi h. So that's what that's b of phi plus theta. And this one is what? Is the gradient of B of phi. It's a matrix. You need to transpose it. But you apply on theta, and there's a minus there because it's... So these are these equations that you... These are called instanton equations sometimes. <coughs> okay? They're quite nice. And they are well, well uh, suited if you want to calculate an expectation, so if you want to calculate this guy, this quantity, then, I mean, you remember that in that case, you have to minimize this minus that. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what that ends up being, if you write down the equation like that, is that you need to solve the that is an initial condition phi of like that. And then this one has a final condition, which is theta of t is equal to f of phi of t. That f. And the way you need to do this is that this guy, you need to solve, it's well posed if you solve it forward in time. And that one is well posed if you go backward in time. Okay. In particular, there are simple algorithm to do that. It's just that you make a guess for one of the two, and then you do go side L, which is that you solve for phi as if you knew theta, and then you, you use that phi that no, you know to solve for theta without any you iterate one at a time. When you integrate this guy, you keep that one fixed, then you fixed as a curve, right? The whole path. When you solve this one, you keep that one fixed from zero to t, and then you iterate. And, and you can show that these are converged. And, and you, you can write that one backward in time because you have a final condition. And then what's forward in time because you have a final condition, an initial condition. Okay? These are the instanton equations. They really only work posed this way. If, if, for example, this was a, I don't know, if, if this, suppose that I not, don't look at an ODE or an SDE, but I would look at an SDE, this would be a diffusion equation, for example. Then this would be diffusion, and that would be anti diffusion. So that's why you need to go back one time. These equations are, in fact, kind of interesting to look at because they tell you that you have to, this, these are the typical equations that come into control problem, right? When you have a control like a game, someone needs to do something and the other one needs to play against you or with you, you typically get into equation like this. And you see that what this is, is saying, if I, look at, if I compare the structure of this guy, which is obviously here there was a random noise. And here, this random noise has been replaced by a, a, something which is deterministic, theta. And this theta solves its own equation, which is the adjoint equation. And in fact, this is saying what, exactly what, what you think it is saying, is that among all of the realization of eta, of the noise, the process with very high likelihood, that's just a sense of large deviation, picks the one where the noise is optimal for the event at n. In other words, to the, 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 the noise that maximizes, you know, the, the, the event of maximum likelihood with respect to calculation of this expectation is the solution of this equation. And you can interpret this theta here as being the optimal realization of the noise for the calculation of that expectation. Okay. That's that. Now, <clears throat> these equations are not very, these are unfortunately, 
not very well adapted. So this is for this case. <coughs> but if I want to compute anything where the minimization is such that I want to go from x to y, then I have this thing. These are the boundary conditions that I need to put. Right? This is if I want to minimize the path. Okay? If it goes from a point x to a point y. Okay. Now, you could think about there are many, there are many ways to, do, to try to do this calculation. There is one that's certainly bad, and that's the first one you could think about, which is shooting method. What is shooting method is that you make it, you, you, you treat it as, a, you, you solve this equation. And somehow, you, you choose a theta, you see where it leads to, and then you try to adjust theta so that you shoot towards y. Okay? It's a very badly conditioned method in high dimension, precisely because that guy should be solved backward in time. So if you want to solve this problem, you unfortunately need to forget about this, which was easy because you'd solve ODEs here, right? If, you were, this, if this wasn't... Stochastic differential equations are just order differential. If it was a stochastic PD, it would be PD. There is no notes. But if you know to solve this problem, you need to forget about this guy, and then you need to go back to the Lagrangian. So I'm just going to write two formulas, if I still have one minute, which is what do you do then? Well, of course, you could write down you could write down the Euler Lagrange equation associated with that. But the Euler Lagrange equation, unfortunately, are not very. So, what are the Euler Lagrange equations? Right? You know, if I want to solve this, I could simply write uh, dl d phi is equal to dl d phi dot dot. Right? These are the, I mean, the critical point of this action satisfied the Euler Lagrange equation. Yes? So, you know that. But it's, it's, it's better to think about it slightly differently. In fact, derive these equations. I'm going to do that. I don't know what So, which is, you could think about this as, think about that in the following way. I'm going to introduce an artificial time. So, I'm, so I'm looking for a phi of t, but I'm going to introduce a tau here, which will be an artificial time. Is that also why I showed you these movies? Then I'm going to start with a guess. Which is I'm going to find, I'm going to start with a phi zero of t, which, by the way, of course, de de uh, depends also. Okay, so, 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 so. I'm going to start with a guy like that, which is such that phi zero of zero is x, say, and phi zero of t is y. So I have my point x, I have a point y, and that's what I did, for example, I just <coughs> go. Yeah. And then I'm going to relax this path. So that it, it minimizes this. So how do you do that? Well, you essentially view this object as the energy of the path. So you write this equation, d tau of phi. This is the artificial time, right? Artificial time for relaxation of the path. You write this is equal to, well, <coughs> no, it has become a functional. So you need to write minus the d i t phi over d phi. This is a gradient flow in path space where I use the action as a potential. So we can write this equation, right? And it evaluated what I have to write what two signs. If you write it down, it go like this. These are these are viewed as matrices. These are made, you know, by grad B. You know, grad B I J is is D B I over D X J or D five J. Okay, that's the way they are written. 
So if you if you calculate this gradient, right, which you do by first variation, what you end up is this. So you end up, you see that the physical time becomes like a diffusion term along the, the curve, right? So it's, that part is like a diffusion equation where the artificial time is the real time, the physical time has been has become a distension term, and then there's all kind of terms that arise here. And you can design methods to solve this, to relax the path. And what they will do is in the non-gradient case, do what you saw in the, the previous uh, step. Now let me just show you that this, of course, is consistent with what I said before, which is that if b is equal to main minus the grain of u, then this guy is just grab is the Hessian minus the Hessian. Okay? That means that in I'm gonna specialize this in this case, what you end up having there is that you get this quantity, right? It's equal to dt square phi. Then these two terms cancel because this this tensor and this tensor it's it, it's it's uh, it's symmetric. <coughs> so these two guys cancel. And the only one that I get is this one which is minus grad, grad, u, on grad, u, okay? And of course, when I relax this, right, I would, you see, you solve this as a diffusion equation with endpoints that are fixed. What I want to find at the end is the one where this guy goes to zero, because in fact, this is, I mean, you know, th this part here, if this is equal to zero, I go back to that. This is the same equation that I've written. And so, in particular, in the gradient case, when you relax, you do it like you can do it like that, and you can check uh, easily that if pi dot, which here is written as dt phi, is equal to minus gradient of u, then uh, if I uh, then dt squared of phi is equal to the derivative of that, so by chain rule that's grad, grad, u, dt phi, but since I use the equation, this is equal to uh, grad, grad, u, grad, u, right? But if I had done that with a plus, I would have gotten a plus here, but this sign is unchanged, because whatever sign that was here is cancelled by the sign plus there, yes? So you are, this relation is true whether you have plus or minus. This is equal to that. Which means that this, this solution, phi dot equal plus or minus gradient of u, are the stationary solution of this equation, which we already knew because they are the minimum energy part that I told you about before. That's the one that go up here and down here. That's the only thing you can get a stationary point for a gradient system, right? Now, for non-gradient system, so if you go back to this equation, right, and you want to solve that by relaxation, well, then life is uh, much more interesting, but also much more complicated, because the, the you cannot write down this little argument fails, and you don't know in general whether the solution of this equation. You need to solve that memory. Okay? But it's not that bad. It can be done in fairly high dimension. And we, we, have, we have done that. I'll show you an example later when we motivate. Okay? But that's, that's it for today. what is the minimizer of this energy. The, the simplest method I would do is I would take the, you know, the gradient of this guy, so d, in, it's, a, it's a functional thing, so I would take that minus, and I would say this is d to, I would relax, right? That, that's the that's steepest descent, right? Yes. So in, in here, in this case, to is my relaxation time, which is an artificial time I introduced, and e, well, this is e, it's i. It's an, it's, an, it's, an, it's an energy on path, okay. and then you minimize the path. 
you relax the path. So in the gradient case, you cancel phi dot with grad u, and phi dot minus grad u. And that makes sense physically. I'm, I'm wondering mathematically why you can't cancel phi dot plus grad u. Um, <coughs> You, you need to decide which one you, you want. Okay, so okay, so that maybe that's a, that's a good point. Let's see if I suppose. So let's go back to this situation. Right, I have one single well. Okay, I have a single well like this, and I want to take the minimization of that starting with x one and ending at x. And you're in the case where this guy is the plus grad u. Right? And I'd like to find a path that goes from there to there, in this direction. That's my phi. Meaning, I want to have that phi at 0 is x1, but phi at time t is x. OK? Well, you can, I mean, yes, it'd be great if I could put that guy to be equal to 0, because then I would have 0 action. But there is no way to do that. Because there is no way you can go from x1 to x without going against the flow at some point. Right? Because everything goes, it's, this guy is a sink. The, all, all your flow lines, if you look at the flow lines, if you look at phi dot or x dot is equal to minus grade in u, they do this. Now they all go down like that. So, see, so you, you need the noise to get off. That's why the action is done zero. And it's just saying, well, you know, I, I could imagine doing many things. I could, you know, imagine to go up, I don't know, by, you know, by, by in fact, this is what happened in the non gradient case. I could maybe do something like this. But what, what, what the theorem tells you is that, no, what's better to do is just to take that. If that guy was the, the one that goes down, just take that one, but write it the other way. Yes, uh, in the Garner Ellis theorem, you had some differentiability condition for the weight function to exist, right? So, what is the equivalent of this condition in this setting? Here, uh, so for this, this it phi to exist, yes, or to be a proper weight function, there were conditions for that. That's right. So Which here, yeah, how do you want to create them? Um, okay, so uh, the simplest answer is that if b is nice enough. Right, so that you can define the ODE, that's all you need for this case, which is with the additive noise. Right? If you look at the multiplicative noise, it's a little bit more complicated. You can still write down the action by using the duality between Hamilton and, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the Lagrangian formalism. Uh, but it's the same thing. The, the, this is a very simple case, in a way, for the action. The reason why it's very simple is because at the end of the day, you are working with Gaussian processes. Right? This is, in fact, this is something I said yesterday. If you were to try to find out what is the action, or this is what we have done here, right? But if you were to try to find out what is the action at time, you know, at finite time for this guy or, or the other one, that's actually quite complicated. Okay? What, what we did here is, is a form of contraction principle, which is it's much easier to write down the action on the path. Why? Because this is a Gaussian process. So I know its action is very nice. Right? And then, you know, from there you can go to x because that's just a change of variable in fast space. And then from there you actually can go to anything else by contraction. By the way, I forgot to say that, but you don't need to do contraction. You could ask what is the probability to go from this point to that point by a path. Well, that's that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll turn another question. Thank you again. And